It's Sports Bazaar. There's a lot to like in this story. It's getting more ridiculous as it goes on. The hunt for the weirdest. What are you talking about? Are you serious? What? So many questions. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you here. <laughs> strangers. Unflattering, but essentially accurate. I'm quite <laughs> exhausted. It's going to get stranger and stranger. Most unbelievable. If you wrote this as a movie, people wouldn't believe it. Stories to ever occur. An epic tale of woe, joy, nutty behaviour. The fact that it's not more well known is just the strangest thing. In the world of sports. This is going to get juicy here, isn't it? We should open a window or something. <laughs> sports Bazaar. How many testicles did he have? Eight. <laughs> and found running naked down a major street in Chicago. <laughs> this, of course, is the last time organised crime and boxing has crossed over. Got up in a press conference. We're here to announce we've swapped our wives. What is going on? It's time for the leaders of the hunt. Got household names for me. It's surely a red flag. It's Titus O'Reilly and Mick Malloy. Welcome back to Sports Bazaar, the second in our, well, what do we call it, our feature of the Tour de France. Uh, You blew me away in our last episode. Uh, It had it all. Jimmy sweeps, itching powder. (laughs) Oysters. Oysters. Some guy with a cork in his mouth (laughs) being towed along by cars. It just had the lot. I had no idea. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing it to my attention. No, well, this is the, that was that we did the 1903, 1904 Tour de France, the first two and ever were, held, and they were cheating from the get go. There was cheating bef- like from the minute there's, and and as we learned in those two races, no winner that wasn't really cheating in yeah. some way. So we're yeah. we're away now. When you think Tour de France, though, you really think doping. Absolutely, it's, it's you know, we, we've the high water mark che- of cheating. Uh, yeah. And doping is the Tour de France. It's cycling, yeah, and it's Lance Armstrong, and it's the well. Why is it cycling? I'd love to say it's because cyclists have no morals, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. you know, it's sort of a bit. It's it's the real reason is it's pure logic. <laughs> so, sports like athletics, cycling, things like this that often come down to seconds or you know, sort of they, they tend to be they're very mechanical. They they tend to have more impact if you dope, and I'll give you a reason why cycling. But cycling is the number one for doping. If you're going to dope, cycling is one to do. And, it. and why? Because quite simply, one. Let's start with the tour just generally before yeah. we get to cycling. Anyway, people don't understand how grueling the Tour de France is. So the no. Tour de France is anyone that can complete the Tour de France in the time these guys complete the Tour de yep. France is a freak, even if they're on every drug right. on the planet. They could pump you and I. So I couldn't just get on the gear no, and, and go out there no, and you could, take on the Pyrenees. No. So so the first thing with do- doping and the Tour de France, so before we even get to cycling, is people got to yep. understand just how hard the Tour de France is. So the Tour de France, it's the modern one as it is now, is 21-day... 21 day-long stages. I couldn't think of anything worse, by the way. Where you're riding the whole day. It's spread over 23 days, so you're going to get a couple of rest days and the whole thing. And you cover 3,500 kilometres. So that's Mm. 2,175 miles. So the first thing is it's an epic ride that you've just got to do, right? Then you've got to consider the flat parts of the race. So everyone knows the mountain bits and think, well, the mountain bits are the hard bit. Well, they are, but the flat's also hard because riders have to maintain, and it's a brutal average speed that most riders couldn't do, which is 45 kilometres. That's their average speed for most of of it. And then they've got to go, for the last 5 to 10 kilometres, they've got to go up to 60 k's and maintain it for Mm. for up to 10 kilometres. So this is just... Enormous, and then at the very end, they sprint at the end of all that for eighty to up to speeds of eighty kilometers an hour. To do so, to do that, you got to work out how much power you need to produce to get to those speeds and maintain it. Right? Yeah. This is where this is the bit. It's a bit of math. It's a bit of maths, but it, it'll show how well, yeah, shockingly how good they got are. The tank. Well, cycling is one sport where you can easily measure one thing, which is because they're essentially putting power into a machine yes pedaling you Don't can talk to me like i'm a child by the way <laughs> it's like explaining I, this to a I, five-year-old you won't be able to see this if you listen to this on the podcast but <laughs> you actually I made the it? motion of pedals then to you <laughs> I, i've just i'm not 100 yeah. sure you've yeah. seen a bike before me yeah. <laughs> i'm not convinced it's my natural enemy <laughs> yeah, i'm not convinced like if i was explaining a pub to you i wouldn't oh, be yeah. making hand gestures now so on the, so they can actually measure how much wattage yep. 
a cyclist puts out over the course of the a race. And so, how do they do that? Well, well they can measure on the, Well, on because the eventually the pedal, which I'm miming to you again, yes. is like a dynamo. It, you, how fast it spins, that's how any electrical motor works, you know, any motor works. It's like an episode that, of the Curiosity Show now, isn't it? Yeah, they can measure that output, right? So they okay, so cool. unlike a lot of other sports, with a bike you just know how much and you can actually put a machine and measure the wattage output by how fast they're pedalling, right? On these bikes, can you? Is it like a black box recorder? Can they? Can yeah, they, they at the end of a stage look at it? The, yeah, at they the can. Data, they, they like off, they do in a Formula yeah, One. Yeah, well, they often or, have um, things on them as well, so they can, you know, on their bodies, like you know, the equivalent of, an, like you know, you can do this like with a lot of Apple watches and stuff now, right? Like this, mm. this stuff is telemetry output calories burnt everything they measure Who about on like a it? old person's motorized scooter <laughs> could you collect the data it's, on now that would be a, a tour de france down, like, down the shops. Like <laughs> oh you that should be like on the undercard <laughs> yeah that's don't right. you reckon like there's they, a warm up event no they set them off first like four to five days before in a handicap like the stall gift yeah absolutely. so they get a two and a half day head start yeah that is your uh, handicapping <laughs> <laughs> then it's scooters. Then it's e-scooters. E-scooters. <laughs> oh my god! Fine with the bikes coming. Be fun. A unicycle. Unicycle. Unicycles yeah. last. I like the penny farthing racing. I know that we missed the beat that not taking off. Why would? Because the dis the the falls off them would just be worth. I would like to see penny farthing races at a velodrome. Yeah, that would be fun. Just the chaos. Can you imagine? You know, you know the bit where they stall them up the top. I reckon and the first death might put everyone off in a bit. <laughs> so to give you an idea, on the this is on the flat stages of the Tour de France. To the reach, cyclists nuts, like you know, well, the, swimmers listen to are it. nuts. Yeah, th this yeah. is this is what put in it. So for the Tour de France races, so as long as the distance, I mean, just to keep the speeds you need to be competitive, right? You need to produce between two thousand and two thousand five hundred watts, right? Done. Now. How does that compare to a normal fit person on a bike? Fit person, not you and I. Fit person, <laughs> right? Someone who rides regularly on the weekends yeah. of that. They usually, a, a man on a bike, a fit bloke on a bike, yeah. will pull 800 watts and a fit wow. woman will do 600 watts. So a Tour de France person's doing 2,500 2, watts. Jeez. So they're not just a little bit better, they're in another universe. Yeah, sure. This is without drugs, you know, you add right. the drugs in. Now, so then, then the riders also have to tackle the micro, the mountains, which you've got to go up as high as 250 metres above sea level, um, and it, often you have multiple ascents. Now, at that height, you get altitude sickness, and the lack of oxygen reduces your capacity That's when by 15%. That's when they undo their jacket. That's when they undo their jacket. Your favourite moment. I love it. So to do those mountain climbs, you need to output 450 watts while you're going up them, which is much harder because you're on that big steep. And you've got to hold that 450 watts of output for like 30 to 60 minutes. Now, the best cyclists who are amateurs could do that between 30 and 120 seconds. All right. The Tour de France guys are doing it for up to an hour. So, this, so is just, this is just how much better. Now, that energy output means that you consume 6,000 calories per day. Yep. Right? The average <laughs> human is 3,000 calories per day. So, oh. like they're doing double what... What normal? I mean, you and I eat six thousand a day, but, but we're carb loading for, <laughs> <laughs> for the post show yeah. tricks. Yeah. So this is. So I'm just showing. This is oh, the you're, amount. You're painting of stuff. the picture for us. So so they that, are so in the elite category. They're on the elite for category. Aerobic fitness yeah. for everything and power output everything. But they're also being asked to do something. The Tour de France is asking the human body to do something that is on the the very outer cusp of what the human body can really do yeah. on its own. So you're already at the point where to really do it, it's to do it without any drugs or any assistance, yeah. almost impossible almost to begin impossible. with. So that's one reason of the day thing. Just quickly, you mentioned the Apple Watches before. Yeah. Do you know I famously took 43 steps in one day? <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> you know, no. You, I, you don't need to tell me you're joking. Yeah. I'm hung out with you. And I tried to work it because I was looking at the data and it goes, a 24-hour period, 43 steps. And I've worked it out. It was from my couch to the toilet and back. to the bar fridge to the couch. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure it was while I was watching the Tour de France. I don't think this is... 43 as, steps. I don't think this is as surprising fact as you think it is. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm doping. I had to. Yeah. I, and you was, those you, last seven steps, was I probably wouldn't have got. So, so I got the yellow jersey. <laughs> so the first thing I'd say about some friends is like you're on the edge of really what humans can do. So doping is kind of like a lot. Yeah, okay. A bit like you and the couch. The other thing is the second thing is because it's so simplistic. Aside from like some of the team tactics, which they all do for wind resistance and the quality of the bikes, which are all fairly similar. Yes. The really only thing that separates any cyclist from another is that power, how much power, power they can yeah. output, right? So if you can boost that power, it has a difference. Now, this is how much you got to understand, and this is why really cheating happens more than any other reason the Tour de France and doping does, is because the smallest increase in power makes a huge difference in your results. The, the, the Tour de France is so close. Right. So to give you an example, it, Chris Froome, who won in Great Britain for 2015, in the he ran the race in 84 hours, 46 minutes and 14 seconds. If the 16th place cyclist, who was Thibault Pinois of France, had improved his power output by just 1%, just 1% yes. his power, he'd have come first by 12 minutes. He'd have gone from 16 to f- first by 12 minutes if he just improved his power output right. by 1%. So in cycling, now you take a footy team, a Premier League team, a gridiron team, and you improve the worst team in the league by 1%, they're not winning no. the Super Bowl. They're not winning the league. It's like it's just, bowling. You know, There's probably no need It's, it's almost exactly the same. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean? Like sport. Would, so, what would help in Tim bowling? What would help? Yeah. Beta blockers, beta probably blockers. to steady your hands. Yeah, that would be the one to take in those. The first drag sheet at the Olympics was a shooter. Yeah, they, they used to take them all the time to. No, the first no, one was actually, he was drunk. The first, and he was drunk. He well, was, depends, he was on alcohol. The first first drug ever knowingly taken was strychnine um, in the 1904 marathon. The big call. But it, it wasn't banned. So it wasn't the first drug sheet because it was all legal back then. And the same is going to be the true with the Tour de France. But I thought, so shooting, I thought it was a, drug, a shooter who was found to have taken alcohol because mm. uh, that's again, slows he down He was the your first habit. band. Huh. Not the f- yeah, and so and he they, was the first and band. And they knew he was drunk because he was shooting at road signs. <laughs> <laughs> and he was on his bucks. Yeah, he, he, he did a drive-by. He didn't know it was the yeah, Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a sawn off. He had a sawn off. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so I'm just Not saying enough for the sawn off in the shooting. I reckon the no, sawn off shooting is the shooting. Good. That'd be good. Yeah, no, I think so. So, so yeah, with pistol the, whipping. What if you could as a in the sport, shooting at the Olympics? <laughs> the pistol whipping. <laughs> <laughs> the the fifty uh, meter pistol whip. You have to catch and pistol catch someone, someone in fifty rob them, meters. Rob them. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, you're an idiot. And when you ma'am. stand on the podium, you can <laughs> shoot it into the air. So, <laughs> if I could get back on track. Yes, pardon me. The Tour de France, it's one of the hardest things to ever do. So, that's so that one makes reason. sense to me. Right. So, and the margins second, are so slim, uh, any advantage. Yeah, so, ta- so taking lots of, you know, drugs in football, you know, or yeah. baseball or something, it, 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 well, baseball does, but so, some of those, it doesn't make for a team, it doesn't make as big a difference. Being 1% better. In Tour de France, being 1% better is the difference between 16th and winning by a mile, like by 12 minutes. It's a right. huge yeah. difference. So that's why they do it. So it's it's. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm just saying it makes a lot of logic why they do it. It sounds like you're excusing their behaviour. <laughs> it does sound like that a lot. It sounds like you're, you're pro doping. <laughs> I'm very uh, yeah, very pro doping. <laughs> I wish I had some doping now. Is, uh, there, anyway. is there different ways of doing it, or are they all employing the same techniques? No, it's changed. So let's go back to even before the tour. De- so cycling, because of this reason. All, and it's so tough. It always had this doping thing. Even before the Tour de France, it had all sorts of problems with cycling. One of the earliest races, they were known to put in anything in their bodies and it was all legal too. So unlike now, really, it was totally legal. So in the late 19th century, for example, there's an American cyclist who was a champion called Major Taylor. Isn't that a great American name? I love it. That's his actual name. It's not a title. He's racing in New York and he was on such a cocktail of drags that he was um, – started to hallucinate and stop <laughs> raiding. And when asked why he couldn't keep racing, he was like equivalent of a velodrome sort of yeah. thing. He said, I cannot go on with safety for there is a man chasing me around the ring with a knife in his hand. <laughs> Everyone looks around, there's no one. And it was all the drugs, right? Oh, so, mate. So when the tours kicks off, even in those That's early like the ones, time, who's the actor who plays Iron Man? Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. was seen at an intersection going bonkers yeah and uh, a traffic stopped and I said what's going on he goes I'm being attacked by bats <laughs> <laughs> it's never good that man went no on to be the highest paid actor in these 
<laughs> it's always the one uh, actors least used to. I think it was naked. I think it was naked in a. I mean, we've all done it. Yeah, we've but all in, driven in naked it, while being attacked by bats on drugs. Uh, attacked by imaginary bats. So the start of the tour from the very big early ones, enough. they were all on caffeine, strychnine, cocaine, and alcohol from the first tours. <laughs> they were all like my rider. Huge quantities of alcohol because drinking wine just dulls the pain. And wine remained part of the Tour de France for the riders up until the 60s. It wasn't until the incredible. 60s they stopped drinking the wine. So this all happened and no one reported it on was it. Was there a red wine or a white wine? Or what, is there a white wine in better? the day. <laughs> Transitioning <laughs> white wine in the transitioning day. to red. You have a rosé <laughs> in the, in the, as right. dusk <laughs> starts to fall. <laughs> it also depends if you're having fish. Or oysters. Wow. Like if you're pairing it with oysters, you know, you go on the white. <laughs> anyway, so the public don't know about the bubbles? doping or don't Could you have care. bubbles? Well, you're in France, only in the Champagne region. <laughs> and when you go, maybe that you have to have a wine that's indigenous Match, to the region. You're, 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 probably you're matching your wines yeah, to, to the, the region. stage. To the the French would do that. The French, the wine pairing at <laughs> the stage. I'm sure there's people who... I'm sure people will contact us and tell us this is true. I'm sure there are people who watch the Tour de France and pair wines to the region the race is currently in. I'm positive. Of course they do. I'm po- we should do that this year. Okay. Do we if need an excuse to pair wines? Less than 43 steps, I'm in. <laughs> um, that would be fun. That would be fun. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the first time the public actually became aware, because you got to remember it's not illegal, right? No one cares about... Yeah. If you're doping, you're doping. No one cares, right? Or drinking or whatever. No one, no All one's right. thinking about it. So the first time the public sort of got an insight, and the reason people were happy, the riders were starting it, like would tell because it's not illegal. It's it's it's, it's completely legal to do do stuff. So first time the public actually get a sense that drugs what are a used time in to the live, tour. By the I know, way. I know. That was such a nanny state now. Um, <sighs> was the brothers uh, Francois and Henri Pellissé. Henri had won the 1923 tour and they both took a journalist through their bags who was doing a story on them <laughs> while they were competing in the 1924 tour to France. Yeah. They pulled out various packages. They, and this is a quote from them. They said to the journo, because it was all printed up because they didn't get it, they said, cocaine to go in our eyes, chloroform to for our gums, and do you want to see these pills? We keep going we keep going on dynamite. In the evenings we dance around our rooms instead of sleeping. Okay, so a couple of things. So that's a direct there. quote in the actual paper. Why would cocaine help your eyes? They put it in their eyes. Why? I don't know, it keeps them alert. You'd be a shaky vision, wouldn't you? Well they, they now be reckon like cocaine Cylon. is not a particularly yeah, good <laughs> Uh, enhancing drug. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're a <laughs> What are you doing? Um, so this. What else? So this. So was, what was the other So words? they had chloroform. That's chloroform. Well, it knocks you out. Yeah, I know. And then so, they surely would, if you want to go to sleep. I think it's the numb bits because they get sore gums and stuff, so they numb it. And then they and then the pills are all amphetamines and things and things like this. So we get more into this in a sec. So this wasn't something the authorities. Though when these guys did this press conference, who walks around with chloroform in a bag if you're not? I reckon there's a, a few guys killer. I've known that I went to high school with. <laughs> so pulling out all these, <laughs> they, they, they show all the journalists this. And you've got to remember, the authorities don't go, how dare you do this interview, <laughs> right? The, and Because the authorities aren't turning a blind eye. It's legal to the point where in the 1930 Tour de France rule book, given every single rider, it reminds them in the rule book that drugs would not be provided by the organisers. And fair call, so. <laughs> so it actually you says, take a remember stand. to bring your own drugs. <laughs> Like like a party at your like house, your bag. like 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 <laughs> like your like you got your yeah. Your, they're basically drug mules. They're, they're like saying they're, yeah, bring your own drugs. Don't we're not gonna we're we're not gonna provide you drugs. Shit. You have to provide them. So that's how thing. Now often, and this is still all legal. Riders would often then go down from tainted drugs on mass. So half the peloton would suddenly oh, like because be hallucinating. And again. the excuse that was always given to the media um, was that they had eaten bad fish. So it's how a bunch of riders have got sick because it's bad fish to the point where it happened so much that bad fish became code in and the media yeah. for drug yeah. doping scandal. Yeah. Right, fish is on the pong again. Yeah. So then the next major shift of all this is they've got a problem with the hell of it. Yeah, that's right. The next major shift then the tool that came the arrival of amphetamines. So yeah, stay off the cod. Stay off the cod. <laughs> so the, the amphetamines come along. So the Nazis are the ones that in World War Two really. Um, use a lot of amphetamines when they do their blitzkrieg. They didn't do. They didn't do a lot of good. But well, Hitler was on a lot of amphetamines well, in the end. Well I've, I've always maintained he made some bad decisions. 
<laughs> so uh, you but know, they so, don't get enough credit for that. Yeah, the Nazis really pioneered a lot of the use of speed and amphetamines, and then even the British and the Americans use it often with their pilots and things like this. So, yeah, the, so the so the amphetamine industry really got going. But of course, when the war finished, and you know the soldiers <laughs> don't need it, of course, who steps in? Both the public yeah. and athletes. And one of the big users of amphetamines right after that. Sure, was, a lot of fighter pilots when in their. Uh, Mess. Yeah, they'll play table tennis because table tennis apparently is hand eye, keep quick, their eye high in. twitch. Yeah, either that or just whack some cocaine <laughs> on <laughs> you your just, eyeballs. Yeah, no, that's fine. But that's true. So they would yeah. take take drugs and play table tennis. Yeah, and and they often just took it to keep them awake. And the cyclists, I do that. I just don't play it. <laughs> you fly play You've got those forty three steps to, to cover off, though. Right. So. So suddenly the table tennis the Who, that's is, a, is that surprising to you? Not really. Well, table tennis is well. There's a great story about Michael Jordan yes, and please. table tennis, where highly competitive. I believe. Right there, and it's in the Jordan rules that book that was that famous mm. book about him. And, and Jordan was he was losing to like their backup center, who was, was the only guy he couldn't beat at table yeah. tennis, right? And it was driving him mad. That he, because he's so competitive. Yeah. Like this guy's at this point the greatest basketball that's ever lived, and he, he's all he's focused on is that he can't beat the backup center at table <laughs> tennis. And one of his teammates tells this story in the book that he came down at this hotel at three in the morning because he couldn't sleep, and he hears a table tennis game going. So he wanders into the rec room, and Michael Jordan's put one end of the table tennis p- table up. And he's just playing against himself, practicing Unbelievable. until he could beat this guy at three in the morning. <laughs> they got a game the it. next day. Who was there? Was a, there was drug cheating in the table tennis? Oh, that's you the know? story. We oh, oh, that's is all, that for another time. That's for another time. Wow, yeah, there's a great, there's some great table tennis one. Yeah. Um, so in it, so so amphetamines have come in. So in a television interview, the winner of the tour in 1949 and 1952, Fasto Copy, mm. he admits openly that he had used a special cocktail he called La Bomba. <laughs> Which he put in his water <laughs> bottles, right? So La Bomba. That it's called Bomba. Now you want to know what's in La Bomba? Please. It yeah. contained amphetamines, caffeine, opiates, ether, cocaine, chloroform, and alcohol. Jesus! <laughs> Seriously. Wow. So that's shaken over ice. <laughs> yeah, that's there right. it was. I think in a suburban nightclub, I've had that um, cocktail. Um, that's, that's 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 kind of so he, better than he the admits, Maduri he says, shaker. Yeah, so here's here's the, here's the winner, and this is where yeah. I say like Lance Armstrong is not some outlier. Like no. he's the winner of the forty nine fifty two Tour de France, just admitting on publicly. I take this as my thing, La Bomba. They said, "When do you use it?" And he said, "Only when I have to." And they said, the gentleman said, "And when when's that? When do you have to use it?" And he said, "Almost all the time." <laughs> These are their public comments. So, these aren't like it's not like secret. Popeye. It's not like no, and not, it's not like after they retire they tell these stories. It's like they're, they're telling them while they're winning Tour de France. It's like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, great. Um, so here's how they're alone. Five-time Tour champion, 957, 61 to 64, Jacques Onsatel. He would inject morphine to dull the pain in his body and then take amphetamines to prevent the lethargic effects of the morphine. Makes sense. Yeah, you got to balance yeah. uppers and downers, you know. That's a balanced diet to do morphine and amphetamines. a bomba. So he once said, you would have to be an imbecile or a crook <laughs> to imagine a professional cyclist who races for 235 days a year can hold the pace without stimulants. So he's just saying, yeah, just, it's this not is happening. rife, everyone's doing it, it is ridiculous. Get on board. He also said, for 50 years, bike racers have been taking stimulants. Obviously, we can do without them in a race, but then we would be pedal about 15 miles an hour instead of 25. Since we're constantly asked to go faster and to make even greater efforts, we're obliged to take stimulants. So he's just very like similar, that, right? He's like, we're giving the people what they want. Yeah, and everyone's taking them. So if we're going to, we'll if you're going to compete, yeah. Other ones use analgesics to manage their pain. So these like opiates, opioids, and things like that to stop you being in pain because it's like on the edge. That's of when the hallucinations start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the yeah, dangers right. of these drugs came like 1960 tour. Roger Revere. He was going down uh, one of the mountains. He went off the road and into a ravine. He broke his back and had to be helicoptered out. Wow. And he blamed his mechanic, saying his brakes had failed, but the doctors found that he had um, a variety of drugs in his um, things, and they well, reckoned that the drugs numbed his fingers so he couldn't do the brake levers. Well, you know their official finding? Bad fish. <laughs> Bad fish. <laughs> 
I said it's not great. Yeah, today. so he'd later admit he also took drugs and amphetamines as well. So they think he took so much drugs he couldn't work the brakes. He couldn't anymore. feel his fingers. He couldn't feel them, so he couldn't do wow. the brakes. That's how he came up. Um, that was sort of like he, he, he almost died and ended up in wheelchair. So that was sort of a wake up call that they might need to do something about yeah. illicit drugs. We wanted to rein this in. Yeah, so that's in 1960. But they still went, yeah, I think we're okay. True. Sure. I don't think we need to ban it. This time, most teams, though, there's teams, they're allowed to have legally have teams, and they start to have someone called a soigneur who is basically um, it's someone who helps with transportation and supplies. A mule. But basically, it becomes the person responsible for providing drugs. So they have oh, a so person it's now an official on, position. It's, a, it's pretty much an official position <laughs> on their team. I wouldn't mind one of those. Yeah, they're sought out for their expertise in mixing drugs. So they follow the teams around. Can you, have, can you employ one? In, in well, now they call them like they're just another team member. But for a long time, you had a soigneur. And their whole thing was they would help with logistics, drive things around, but that their real job yeah. was, and a lot of them were really a good. Swan, yeah, yeah, and I'd like that. It's I'd, a like, nice I'd like a swan, yeah, and a sherpa. <laughs> have you ever wanted to just have a sherpa like in real life? Like someone who just carries things just around carries for things. you. Oh, yeah, so you slab home for the pub or you, <laughs> you know stuff gets your stuff. There's one say reason forty three steps here. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're in big agreement. We'd like to have staff. <laughs> Um, so the, the problem, Sherpa, what a great sorry, a Sherpa but, and a Swan, yeah, Swan, yeah, yeah. That's meet, what. The, meet the staff. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I hope you don't mind. Bought my Swan, yeah. The Swan, is gonna hang out. Do you guys need anything? <laughs> which one's the Sherpa and which one's the Swan, yeah, again? Uh, who do I get? I the, know, who do I get to carry and who do I get I the drugs the from? Been spending too much time with the Swan, yeah. <laughs> this game's really dropped. <laughs> All right, sorry, go on. <coughs> so we're still, it's still legal and still now legal. it's a proper position. Well, then in the 1962 tour, and this started happening a lot because you'd have these swan years, sometimes they'd work for one team, but others would work for numerous cyclists or numerous okay. teams. If they stuffed up the mixing of their drugs, yeah. they all went down. So in the 1962 62 tour, 20 riders go down from an unknown illness <laughs> and straight away bad fish has given us the reason. <laughs> But really, they'd all had the same concoction from the same soigneur. And the, the organisers know this, right? So all these things come up. Tour organisers decide, we've got, we've got to do something. This is after 60 to tour because behind the scenes, doctors, the real doctors, not the soigneurs, <laughs> they're saving riders' lives every year from drug-related ca- crashes. During the, the Tour de France. The tour. But it's just covered up. No uh, one's, overdoses or anything like that? Is or is it overdo- just accidents? But no, both. Overdoses, people falling off bikes, people passing out, heart attacks, every, the whole lot. Like it's just a mess behind the scenes. Because you've got it these guys... It sounds like a Mardi Gras or something. It doesn't sound yeah. like a, a hard sporting event. Yeah, it's just everyone's on drugs and they're trying to do something that's almost impossible to do at a speed that is almost impossible to sustain. Yeah. And then funnily I'll enough, it's, it's not all going well. So as of, and this is what's amazing how late this is, at, on the 1st of June 1965, performance-enhancing drugs become illegal in the Tour de France. 1965. Right, and yeah. was there an incident or they just went, enough's enough? No, that was all the ones, there was all these things happening. So, the, the you know, they'd had several and it was, you know, and the, and, and the one in 62 where 20 riders all go down with this illness of bad fish, that was when they started to go, oh, this is starting to look yeah, bad. No. But then also they were having doctors say to them all the time, the organisers, we're saving people's lives every year. Someone's going to die. Okay. You need to do something about so this. So this is a very important, pivotal moment in the history of the Tour de France. For, for the, so, so 1966 is the first clean, legal... <laughs> bu- <laughs> Let me ask you, Mick. <laughs> what do you reckon? Bring in the swan years. <laughs> do, you, do you reckon the riders but, appreciated this bear? Yeah, no, I don't reckon they'd see the funny side, to be honest. So the first tour under the new... That would rules. kill your buzz. Yeah. yeah so the first, so the first way well, yeah, they bring in this rule and they say, first of June 1965, performance enhancing drugs are banned. Do they do any testing? <laughs> no, nah, they do none. So, so did no one? They didn't even engage. They didn't even engage. They didn't do any testing. They didn't search anyone. They did nothing. It was just technically illegal. But it was like our, so all our, that had changed. Our public stances. Is, it's illegal. It's illegal. But they there was no way they didn't they didn't do any, they put zero effort into actually finding out if anyone was using them. They just told them they shouldn't. <laughs> they told them it was illegal, but they didn't do yeah. anything. So it's like saying we'll change this law, but we're not going to enforce it. That's basically what happened. In 1966, they drug testing finally arrived. They finally said, right, okay. we've got to do. So 1966. So on the eighth stage, rider Raymond Polydor was the first ever Tour de France rider to have to give a urine sample. 
And the riders all decide as a group, this is degrading, an invasion of their privacy. So the very next day, not long after the start of the stage, they all walked for five minutes pushing their bikes in protest. <laughs> Because of drug testing. It's like a tools down. The organisers end testing for the year. <laughs> Straight away. They go, all right, we'll, we won't do it anymore. Wow. The next year, the tour started, most riders just outright refused to be tested. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that no, they thanks. just go, nah, I'm not doing it. And the organisers go, well, we can't suspend all of you. So they just let them not get tested. So that's... So, you know, you, we're getting in. They're not running a tight ship, they're not these guys. We're three years into the ban and basically no one's been suspended, no one's really been properly tested and they just give up, right? So 1967 <laughs> is the moment this all changes in, in reality. So the leader of the British team, Tom Simpson, he's three kilometres from the top of one of these mountains and he just collapsed. He'd been struggling. He'd struggling already earlier in the day because he had excessive diarrhoea, which in no way is ever good. Not on a bike. <laughs> not, not, on a, a, not, a, <laughs> not on a bike. It's one of those sports, though, where there is a lot of toilet action on the way, isn't There's there? a lot you of stuff going see on. Jumping yeah. off the bike and it's, a, it's another reason in the to bushes. avoid bikes. <laughs> so, so not a job long, for that, like a swan year. Somebody <laughs> comes, a, comes past up behind. And, <laughs> just comes up literally bringing up the rear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he says, so he has that. Do now, they stop? They don't stop. They just wee on themselves. He don't kept they? going, right? So, yeah. but anyway, he pushed himself to keep going. And not long after this, he collapses. Um, not he, and he falls off his bike, but then he gets back on and he drinks brandy to fortify himself because he he's got excessive diarrhea and barely stay on his bike, so he drinks some brandy. <laughs> the second time he falls, he just doesn't get back up, so he falls okay. off his bike and he's just lying there. They come and they airlift him off this mountain. He gets hospital. He dies soon after. And in his po- pockets, doctors find three empty vials and like a chemist's worth of pills, right? Yeah. It's got everything in there. The post-mortem examination found both amphetamines and alcohol in his symptoms, in his, uh, uh, amphetamines and alcohol in his system. So he's just pushed his body and pushed his body and pushed his body I'm, I'm until he just collapsed. I'm surprised the writers allowed the autopsy. <laughs> yeah, this is, right. this is embarrassing <laughs> to right. us and we refuse... To undergo a post-mortem. So this is like Britain's best rider. He's incredibly He's popular cooked. on the tour. He's died on the tour from drugs. Even the riders now can't it's fully... Going, okay. they, they can't... They published the results of the autopsy? Yeah, it was yeah. all known. So, so at this point, the riders go, okay, we'll submit to drug testing. Mm. Right? They finally wake up to it. They realise they can't keep going. So in a way, while it's tragic, you'd think we've at least got that through. Yeah. The thing is, you'd be surprised that... Even though that happens, they don't stop. What oh, happens yeah. here is drug testing becomes a real everyday thing. And so what happens is the modern day game of the Tour de France, which is how to avoid the drug tests how to avoid and the drug get around tests them. Not be there. So suddenly in the 70s, you start to see them all using drugs and the testings, are st- positive tests are still very rare because the testing science isn't very good. So it's very easy to get around. Right. Right? The writers know if I dope from this day to this day, I'll they won't come pick you it can up. If game I'm, the system. I can game yeah. the system really easy, right? So they learn to do it and make sure it's cleared out of their system before it, and it all works. And what are we really talking about? Well. They're weighing in a test tube, is that it? Is yeah, it's just weighing in a test tube mainly. And, and, they do, and one thing they also learn is they learn to substitute urine. So at first, no one's watching them; they just use someone else's urine in a tube. Yeah. Then they start being watched. But well, Jeez, so you want to be careful whose urine you Well, getting. this is 1978, a Belgian rider. You wouldn't get top dollar for mine. <laughs> yeah, you're... <laughs> <laughs> urine test once it had a head on it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Michelle, Seriously. That's, Set that down to forensics. Michel uh, Polienta, he's one of the top riders. He's caught trying to deceive a drug test. Um, and it's a huge story at the time. He's got the leader's yellow jersey at the end of stage 16. <laughs> he goes in to get drug tested. And they watch as you pass urine. And he has rigged up a condom filled with someone else's urine <laughs> and placed it under his armpit with the tube going down inside, <laughs> down to his fly. And so then he pulls the tube out and fills up the urine. But unfortunately for him, another rider had done the same thing early in the day and his had malfunctioned and urine had gone everywhere. <laughs> Just started coming out of his armpit. Oh, that's one of the... It's like a... What, what, do, you, what do you call it? A, a blooper? From the urine testing? Yeah. I mean, don't you think in any phase of life, if you're starting to handle a lot of other people's urine, <laughs> unless you're in the medical 
industry, it's no. it's time to. It's, <laughs> Does someone the, have a fake penis? Yeah, well, that's later on. They do go get more sophisticated. But penis. this was kind of like that, right? He kind of tried to do that. He gets kicked off the tour, and now it's seen like drugs are a thing. Someone's been yeah. banned for them. It's all a bad thing. No one was surprised. So. Um, it's and it's just never really stopped. So it's not a, a, a wake up moment. They all start to go. Oh, we better get better at doing this. So suddenly by the eighties, it's a science. Teams have got doctors traveling with them. They've got drips to rehydrate them in the night. They've got centrifuges which clean riders' blood over the night. So they sit wow. there and it goes through the centrifuge, spins, cleans the blood, goes back into their bodies. Is this on like a team tests. bus or whatever yep. it is. Yeah. Yep. Um, so a, a Tour de France's riders' hotel room in the eighties looks like an intensive care unit. <laughs> Like they are plugged in to like <laughs> lots of things. So in 1991, the entire Dutch PDM tour goes down with a fever. Uh, Mad fish okay, again. Yeah. There's televised images of all the riders shivering uncontrollably as they're helped back to their hotel. And once again, people are going, you yeah, know, the yeah. media wrote headlines, bad fish now because it's an in-joke. Yeah, they know it. Knowing yeah. fully these guys. Now, they blame the fact that they'd intro- incorrectly given them something called intralipid. Now, it's an extract of the soybean. It's not. It's technically legal, but to show you that they're pushing the boundaries of things, yes. it's meant to be a bad batch of it, it's usually used to feed comatose patients in chromis. <laughs> so even though it's like not a full... Many it's, didn't it's believe, though, incredible. that that was the reason of the fevers, right? R- Rumours just circled around saying, no, it's actually a human growth hormone. It's EPO, um, which is a naturally What's that occurring. Do? Tell thing. me what that does. Well, it's one that um, it's, it's made in a lab and it causes bone marrow to produce more red blood cells, which improves the body's ability to transport oxygen. It's often called a blood booster. Yeah. So it just makes you carry. So that, a lot of people do, said. It, does other sports do that? Lots that of sports. That's a, re- that's a very EPO. good one, EPO, to, you know, to use it and stuff. So there was was rumours that it wasn't um, the intralipid, that it was actually EPO. And um, the entire PDM team, they the, they quit the sport at the end of that tour because of this incident. Wow. And it's bought by a franchise, a Swiss watch brand by it called Festina. It becomes the Festina team because they're often named after sure. companies and stuff. In 1997, the rumours of that 1991 tour comes back when it's confirmed that they were taking... Um, EPO and one of the, the one of them came out and said the rule imposed on us by the directors of that team was there was to be no drug affairs, not no drug taking. So That's, don't uh, get caught. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's the general law of taking drugs, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So the arrival of EPO changes everything because they all suddenly start taking like having season long doping programs where they peak and take it down, come back up again. Yeah, they start. T- timing it around the yep. Tour de France becomes they all have medical stuff and everything. Then in 1993, one of uh, a team doctor for a company called Guiz, Michelle Ferrari, who ends up working for Lance Armstrong in the future, he says in a TV interview, EPO is like orange juice, safe in moderation. And then he was shocked when the team <laughs> fired him. <laughs> he he shouldn't have worked too much because he ends up working for Lance Armstrong a uh, lot wow. longer. So before Lance Armstrong, and this is the thing that is the truly amazing thing of this whole story, where we're going, is in early July 1998, so fairly recently, a guy called Willy Voe was driving across Europe on his way to Ireland because the Tour de France, quite a few times in its history, has started outside of France. Why do they do that? Just to spread the tour and make it more exciting. And so they had a stage. So they had a stage that started in Ireland this year. But he is driving across France because it's going to start in a few days and he's driving the official car of the Festina cycling team. So this is the PDM team that got bought by Festina. And it's all decked out in the team logos. And he is the soigneur of this team. (laughs) And he looked after France's biggest cycling star, uh, Richard Verinke, who's who's like the Lance Armstrong in terms of popularity in France at the time and, and seen as above reproach. Yep. So... He crosses the Belgium-French border and the customs officials seem for the first time in a long time with one of these to do their job and actually look in the car. And they find... Hey, uh, on. They've started the Tour de France... In Ireland. And he's in, trying to get to Ireland. In a different country. Yeah, so he's trying to get to Ireland. Knowing that they're all carrying. Yeah, so he's trying, to get to, he's trying to get to Ireland. He's driving from Belgium. He crosses into France. They stop him. <laughs> 
and he's trying to get to Ireland and they stop him and his car's a pharmacy on wheels. It's, they discovered 235 doses of EPO, 82 doses of the hormone sorotropine, 160 doses of pantestone, which is a derivative of testosterone, and a wonderful assortment of steroids, amphetamines, syringes and tell other drug paraphernalia. Tell me there's some chloroform there, I don't please. <laughs> I just... The customs officials say, I think this seems a lot for one person. <laughs> <laughs> so they begin what an investigation. What is invest- wrong with this event? They begin. What? So you've got to remember the the tour itself is in Ireland. So this is, starts. This kicks off an investigation, and no one knows about four. But the the police and customs then raid the Festina offices of the team in Back Leon, in, in, in Leon, yeah. and and they find more drugs and de- details on the computer and everything of this extensive doping right. program, yeah. right? In Ireland, the Tour de France has begun as if nothing's happened. There's rumours, hasn't been made the media yet, that there's been an arrest. But the Festina team, team just said to the media, we don't, that guy's a low-level person in our team. We don't even know who he is that well. Play so they play it off. The Tour comes back to France and all of a sudden the French police arrest Festina sports director and their physician um, and start quizzing them. The the Festina Sports Director, Bruno Rossell, he proves to be a poor member of a criminal conspiracy. <laughs> so he starts confessing that the t- straight away. The minute they interview him, he goes, I'll tell you everything you want. No. So he says, yep, we've got a systematic... He turns. Yeah, he just he turns goes, instantly, though. Like, they don't even... He gets a plea deal? He, 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 I don't think he even gets offered a plea deal. He's just so freaked out. He goes, yep, we've got a systematic doping place in place. So they go and arrest the whole Festina team, all the riders, including the biggest cycling <laughs> star, star in, in the world. Um, the Tour de France director, Jean-Marie Leblanc, mm-hmm. he he's reeling from this and suddenly the, he bans the Festina team, which since considering all nine riders are under arrest <laughs> is kind of... So he didn't want to do it, but his hands were tied. Yeah. He had to be so seen. P- police suddenly are running this investigation and, and for the first time ever in the history of France and the tour, they're not listening to the tour organisations, the tour organisers. They're going, we're, we're investigating yeah. this anyway. So they start raiding all the teams, like all the teams. Like this isn't just lands. this is the whole team they're raiding. The tour management are watching it and they're raiding their computers, they're going to their hotels, all the riders are What's, um, What are the teams questioned. doing? Are they like shredding documents now? They're are they, pulling are out they, of the race. They're pulling uh, out, of the, like they start pulling out, like all they start pulling out, they start shredding documents. Under the questioning in the Festina of the nine riders, all except Richard Verinke and Pascal Hervé admit to doping. They all say, yeah, we're doing it's true. Verinke comes out and says, nah, I does a media conference and says, I'm totally innocent. This is all made up. Right? Bats, I'm coming in bats. Festina writer Alex Zul recalls being interviewed by police. He says, in the beginning the officials were friendly, but then the horror show began. <laughs> I was put in an isolation cell and had to strip naked. They inspected every cavity. <laughs> the next morning they confronted me with compromising documents they had found. They said that we were used to that they were used to seeing hardened criminals in the chair I was sitting on. I wanted out of that hellhole, so I confessed. <laughs> so they're not exactly wow. standing up. No. Um, any sense it was just the Festina team quickly drops um, away because suddenly the police start investigating another. They remember, and the police had conveniently forgotten this, that they'd pulled over another team car for a TVM from the Netherlands earlier in the year and had stopped investigating and went, we better go back and investigate Have a look that, at that one and yeah. find out that it's also full of 140 vials of EPO in the car. So this is while the race is, is on. on. The race is on, right? So the this cha- is a debacle. So they, yeah, this so is a full this blown is a catastrophe. Full every now. team, like this is like way bigger. It's called the Festina Affair, but it's it starts to spread out. So on the rest day, the, there was a rest day in the tour. The police sweep on the hotel where TVM is staying. They arrest a bunch of the doctor, their team manager. In the team's hotel, they find drugs and masking agents and EPO and syringes and everything. The One of the TVM team members says to the media, the police are acting like Nazis. This is in France. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly the most sensitive uh, comment in France. It's out of control. The police then send six of the TVM riders to hospital for blood and urine hair tests. So TVM pulls out of the race. They say we're out. So Fistina are out, TVM are race. They've, they've gone. So there's two teams going. That's a pretty... Pretty that's, big deal. It's an admission of guilt. Pretty much. Really, right. They're all we some of them. Are, some of the individual riders are denying it, and others are. But the team's going. We're cooked. The other riders and the other teams, 
they react to these raids, like the introduction of the doping test, they protest. <laughs> they don't say... <laughs> this is a witch hunt. They go on strike for two hours and refuse to race. That doesn't stop. The police still go after all the leads. They then stage another protest a few days later, cycling slowly before stopping completely, and the th- whole field threatened to pull out of the entire yeah. race. Every team says we're going to pull out unless the police stop investigating this. The organisers cancel the stage and they say, right. The problem is the organisers can't stop the police because it's a police investigation it's a police by investigation. this stage and the media know all about it and everything. And they start to, the police go, well, we don't really care if you stop the race. Like, it's up to you. So then the police start raiding the hotels of um, Team Once, Team this po- is Polti, great. Le Francois Desu, Lotto and Casino. So they arrest, they go in and they arrest a heap of the guys in that and begin. And so suddenly teams are pulling out Left, right, right and centre there. Gotcha. Like teams that one sports director, Manlo Sees, announced his team was leading and he said they were sick of the dawn raids and that had become by the third week of the nine ninety eight tour as common. He says <laughs> I- <laughs> <laughs> so he says, I'm, we're leaving, we're sick, because the police are literally raiding hotels all the time of the riders, and he says to the media, we're leaving, we're going home. He's a Spanish he's a Spanish team, he's a director of Spanish team. He says to the media, I have shoved my finger up the tour's ass <laughs> and returns to Spain. <laughs> all the Spanish teams then Fair follow... enough all, too. All the Spanish I teams reckon. follow suit and quit the tour. They all quit. So teams are dropping around. Like of the 189 riders that started the tour, fewer than 100 are left. Yeah. Um. Uh, finally, they did finish the race, and the Italian Marco Pantani wins. Right now, his victory was slightly overshadowed by this whole Festina affair of everyone l- like quitting and yeah. all the drugs and the charges yes. and everything. But he did win. Um. It keeps escalating. Now he dies. Six years later, of cocaine poisoning, aged just 34. And in 2013, it was revealed that retroactive testing of his urine and blood samples showed that he was also using EPO during the 1998 right. tour. So even though he won, he, he was revealed to it. In, in the following, <laughs> after the, so the race is finished and the results of all the Festina riders become public and they've all tested positive for human growth hormone, amphetamine, steroids, cortisodes, and EPO. So it would be easy to lift what they didn't take. Yeah. The TVM <laughs> riders all return positive results as all. So then it becomes a criminal trial. Can I ask, what's the public's mood? Furious. This is like the, so biggest, the public furious? furious this go, is the biggest. Uh, well, a lot of the French, though, cycling fans, Richard Virinque, he's saying, I am innocent. I am 100% innocent. Mm. And a lot of the French public believe him and they say this is a witch hunt after him. Right. He goes, he he still denies it. And many of them are saying he's innocent and he goes to court because the Festina group and goes um, to, to media and he's called to the um, stand. And up until this point, he's got protesters out the front of the court on his side yep. saying he's innocent. There's a... The presiding, he's finally got his day in court. The presiding magistrate begins by saying to, to Viren K, do you accept this reality that you took doping products? And he says, yes. And and suddenly reverses his whole thing. He then what? says, "What?" He then says, "I took EPO." He says it was like a train going away from me, and if I didn't get on it, I'd be left behind. It was not cheating. I wanted to remain in the family. So he's like, so the sense of betrayal for the French. Why would you go to all the dro- yeah, that? Yeah. Well, suddenly he's in a legal court, and, and he knew they had all the evidence. He knew what was coming. He knew, and suddenly it's not just public so saying to the media. They had his swineri. <laughs> they had so everything. Sitting back going, oh, we're, 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 just before we go, but we're they, about to call you Swinery. Okay, yeah, yeah you they got had me. His blood test. They had his, so he, so this is this betrayal for all the French like cycling fans who's defending him. They just mm. are like, oh my god! So it's just absolutely thing. So that so the the this whole affair, the Festina affair, leads to the development of the World Anti Doping Agency WADA. So it is single handedly basically. It's their fault. It was basically set up yep. in a response. It showed how sophisticated the that doping had become, and it was decided that there needed to be a world body to fight this thing. So it all came out of the Festine affair. <laughs> um, and it ripped cycling apart. And you would think once again it would change the tour. Yeah. But we've learned that controversy never damages the tour. Now, amazingly, and this is the real amazing bit of this entire story. Sure. So the Festina affairs just happened. You've had Richard Verenke go down after denying and denying. He ends up in court, yep. has to confess, and he's ripped to shreds publicly. Yep. 
Now, watching this all happen is a young rider called Lance Armstrong who's recovering from chemotherapy at the time in 1998 and he is reporting on the race for an American TV station. So he is a correspondent at the race watching it happen. He watches all the Festine affair go down, the raids, the people being exposed, the people having to admit after lying. He watches this whole thing right up there close, the confession of Richard Varenke in an embarrassing way. He looks at this and instead of reading it as a cautionary tale, he sees it as a how-to guide. The very next year... He's writing this all down. The very next year is 1999, the year after the Festina Affair, and it's called The Tour of Renewal by the tour organisers. Fresh start. It's the first victory by Lance Armstrong of his seven consecutive victories. The very next year they after just the left coming. Festina. It just never... Ever stop. So when people say this is amazing, if you haven't heard, if you've heard of Lance Armstrong, but don't know about the Festina affair, the Festina affair, Lance Armstrong watches, sees it all happen, and does I'm it the very next year and the first, and goes on to win the next seven. So th- after the Festina affair, the next seven are tainted by Lance Armstrong. This is an incredible story. It just keeps coming, and of course, Lance Armstrong. We, we that, that's we another know. day. We it's, might it's need an, to do the whole Lance hold, one, but. My takeaways from this episode is I just can't stop thinking about having a Swaneri. I just, but having everyone know this is the bloke who's this is the guy organising my. But that, that's the thing. And the rest day you mentioned a rest day. How how common is that? Well, they have two over the course of all the twenty one days, so you get two rest days. But you, you think about it, Lance Armstrong watched Varenke go down. <sighs> And you would think to anyone that would be like, oh, I might, I might give that a miss. But it just nah. never stopped. And that's the Tour de France. That was awesome. I can't wait to continue watching the Tour de France. Enjoy it's the Tour just, de France. <laughs> surely they've got another chapter in them. Thank you for listening to Sports Bazaar with Tyus O'Reilly and Mick Malloy. Uh, we're on all the socials. Follow us there. If you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, it helps us out. And if you've got an idea for a story you'd like us to do or got some feedback, send a, an email to us. We're even on the electronic mail. It's info at sportsbazaar.com. Thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs>